Well, good afternoon to today's lunchtime webinar today on trade unions and conflict resolution. Very uh, good to be with you here this afternoon. Good to see so many people on today as well, not just from the UK, but from around the world to join us for today's webinar, one of a series of webinars. And um, today's topic is all about trade unions, conflict resolution, issues to do with the overlap between mediation and trade union work, some stuff around uh, the role of representatives and the role of mediators, comparing and contrasting. And also hopefully to give you a few tips if you're thinking of using mediation or whether you're not sure whether it's an issue that would be best addressed by your trade union rep or by a mediator, hopefully we'll leave you in a place of bit, being a bit better informed about these kinds of issues. So before we start then, just a quick introduction. I'm Dr. Mike Talbot. I started UK mediation in 1999 um, and more recently we've started EU mediation as well to give us a foothold in the EU post-Brexit and uh, my organisation does mediation services and training uh, across the board for mediators of all sorts and um, we have a, a very wide base in third sector, private sector, work with the armed forces, emergency services universities etc um, a lot of our work you can find on the website i'll be referring you to a few resources as we go along there's a chat box on screen if you're watching us live or if you're on the catch-up um, my colleague will be posting a few links in the chat box as we go along we like to have a bit of interaction with these webinars so if you do have a comment or a question as we proceed please don't be shy pop it in the chat box um, if you'd rather do it by email, that's fine. There's somebody watching emails. And if there's something you think about afterwards, do please get in touch with us uh, by the channels I'll tell you about later on if you've got any thoughts about today's webinar. So today's webinar is all about looking at trade unions and the overlap with what we do as mediators. So first question is, what do we mean by a trade union? Uh, be trying to unpack that a little bit and then talking about this contrast between mediation and having a representative so um, often we see the two things as affording you your employment rights making sure the relationships are maintained at work making sure that your um, employment contract runs smoothly um, so there's some similarity in the ways that you would use a representative and mediation I just want to unpack those ideas a little bit and then talking about when mediation can or can't be used. So the kinds of things that mediation is good for, which is a lot, and then the things that mediation would be less, uh, the remedy of choice, and when you might actually turn to trade union support um, as opposed to using um, mediation as a process. So mediation is a very powerful tool, works for a lot of situations, a lot of um, issues, it's not a panacea. There are things that mediation can't address. So we'll be looking at that as well. And then thinking about some opportunities that would be afforded by mediation um, and, and by the work of your trade union rep uh, and some considerations around that. So I'll leave a bit of time at the end for questions and answers. But like I say, don't be shy. If you think of something as we progress, do pop it in the chat box comment or question and I'll try and address it as we go along. Okay, so let's kick off by talking about what we mean by trade unions. So essentially, a um, couple of definitions here from Unison, um, a group of employees who join together to maintain and improve their conditions of employment. Um, possibly unions being independent of employers is an important feature, uh, but having close working relationships with them. So unions not being, I think in um, the dark days of the 1970s, it was seen that trade unions were in opposition to employers. I think that's changed um, in, in recent decades. Um, so close working relationships uh, between the union and the employer, um, but the independence there being set up. So unions are not um, under the aegis of the employer, they're an independent, often national, sometimes international organisation um, that ensures that people are afforded their employment rights, that there is representation and support for employers around conditions of employment. The way they work is usually there's a network of local branches. So for take Unison as the example, they've got uh, regional branches 
Um, there's one on two of our doorsteps, uh, Central London and also in uh, Nottingham, a large branch over there, um, with representatives usually in each workplace. So representatives usually democrat democratically elected to um, represent that particular workplace. So if there's a, a regional branch in Nottingham, there'll be somebody within Nottingham City Council, there'll be somebody within Boots PLC, there'll be somebody within Nottingham Forest Football Club. Um, so trade union representatives in every workplace. What do they do? Well, the representatives usually are there to negotiate and manage agreements with employers around pay and conditions. So it's not just about agreeing um, what will be the deal um, as the aspect, aspects of the employment contract between workers and the employer, but they tend to manage those arrangements as well. <coughs> check that they're working, check that they don't need modification. And they tend to be around, <coughs> excuse me, around pay and conditions, um, which can include uh, bonuses. It can include um, all the complications that arose during furlough, um, uh, blended working, home working, um, and all of the aspects of paying conditions there. So we know that there were extra, uh, a lot of extra pressures put on workers um, during the uh, lockdown, especially first lockdown with COVID, and trades unions were closely involved in checking that things were working for uh, their members in relation to furloughing, home working, etc. So a good example of where trades unions really came to the fore. Also major changes around redundancy and in the news just this week, massive redundancies at places like uh, layoffs at places like Amazon, uh, a lot of social media firms, um, retailers, high street uh, retailers are closing down week by week at the moment. A um, lot of redundancies going on at the moment. So negotiating terms of redundancy, making sure uh, people are being treated fairly, considering people's futures as well. That's the other thing with redundancy. It's not just about the deal on the doorstep of the company. It's about what's going to happen with the employee who remains often a member of the trades union um, when their employment ceases. OK, so that's the kind of things that trades unions would do for people through their local branches, through the reps in local workplaces, as well as the thing that veers towards um, what we're looking at in terms of comparing and contrasting with mediation is about discussing members' concerns with employers. So it's about giving their members a voice. Um, it's about making sure that an employee's concerns and members' concerns do get raised um, at the appropriate time and place uh, with employers, making sure that there is that channel open between uh, employees and employers. Okay, so... Some stuff there about how um, trade union representation works and a couple of more pointers around that. So in terms of processes, so uh, getting a bit closer now to thinking about uh, mediation as one of the processes that's available to people in a workplace. So what representatives can do is to accompany members to disciplinary and grievance meetings. Within most people's disciplinary and grievance processes, in the workplace and it's enshrined in the employment legislation. Um, employees have a right uh, within those formal processes to be accompanied and they can bring either a colleague um, or a trades union rep or a friend indeed. So having somebody coming along, coming along with you to a meeting where your um, employment is either at risk, which would be the case in a disciplinary, or making sure that procedures are followed correctly and making sure that the employee is able to um, voice their concerns uh, with the employer and get to a place where actually a negotiation can begin. So the representative will come with members and do that. Uh, and also helping with legal and financial issues. So most trades unions would have um, systems to do with ensuring that their members are not uh, running into dire straits really. So especially at these times where people are struggling to afford their gas bills and their food bills and their rent and their mortgage, um, making sure that legal and financial matters don't impact uh, detrimentally on their on their members. So that's what we've got. So that's the animal. Let's have some statistics in time-honoured fashion. Can't have a webinar without a few stats. So what we've got for you today is from um, BASE, which is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. We're hearing that around about one in four of UK employees is a trade union member. Okay, so 23%. About one in four people employed in the UK would be a member of a trade union and the total number in the UK 
uh, about six and a half million okay also from base these are very up-to-date figures just uh, late last year these figures came out so a high number of employees are members of trades unions uh, interestingly a lot of organizations we work with they might be represented by several different trades unions within the same workplace so i know some schools um, where we have some work uh, there might be three different trades unions universities there are three different trades unions um, and uh, you know at the moment a lot of strikes going on it's interesting to see how the unions collaborate in terms of ensuring that their their message gets across we don't want the unions being in competition with each other uh, and often in a single office there might be several people who are members of different unions we want to make sure or they want to make sure their actions are coordinated um, six and a half million people in total uh, would be in trade unions in the UK. So let's continue to veer a little bit more towards the ideas around mediation and think about mediation and representation. So one process is where we've got an impartial third party uh, bringing two or more people together to have a good conversation. And the other one, representation, is making sure that somebody is advocated for, making, somebody, making sure that somebody's voice is heard making sure that that individual's um, concerns get raised appropriately um, in the right time and place. So a lot of similarities between, between these two things, especially around the skills involved in addressing conflicts. So both a union rep and um, somebody involved in mediation, the overall aim, if we like, the global aim, is to promote a good culture within an organization where there's openness where there's trust where there's collaboration uh, where there's a sense of everybody pulling in the same direction okay so having a union rep on your side to ensure that these things happen and having mediation available within your organization would tend to um, head towards the same overall goal of having a good culture having openness and trust in the organization a place where things can be raised a place where conflict is not seen as negative a place where well-managed conflict can lead to change and innovation the other thing is around rights needs and interests so especially with uh, mediation we're looking at interests of individuals what are the underlying needs and concerns of people um, that get raised and that are given due concern and particularly with trade union representation we're talking about people's employment rights as enshrined in the law of the land but also as enshrined in their employment contract and the overlap really is around needs. So what people need in terms of uh, a good working day, a good working week, a safe and equitable working environment, it might be an issue of leaning back on your employment rights or your entitlements, or it might be an issue of having a without prejudice um, informal negotiation with the employer about what needs to happen differently. Okay, so quite a bit of overlap there in terms of those two things, mediation and representation. And in terms of under, underlying knowledge, I think in our experience, a um, good deal of understanding amongst trade union reps around how working relationships can break down and how you might work to maintain them. Probably coming at it from two different angles, the mediator compared to the trade union rep, but essentially having that underlying knowledge about what can go wrong in the psychological contract between the employer and employee, uh, but also what can go wrong in terms of when people are not afforded their full employment rights and how we can work to maintain them. So the mediator might concentrate more on having an ongoing dialogue. Trades union rep might uh, concentrate a little more on people's employment rights and entitlements. But the two things can work very much together. Um, and in terms of addressing conflict or, or differences of opinion around all of this, um, there's more similarities than differences. Differences might be that representatives would tend to be acting on behalf of their members so there's a sense of advocacy of the trades union rep sticking up for if you like their members um, which is not what we're doing in mediation because that trades union rep is not necessarily impartial they are there to support their member the person who pays the subscription into the trades union to to be blunt about it so they are acting for the member more than for the non-member so in a dispute um, they wouldn't be impartial. Um, that's the bottom line. Whereas with mediation, which I'll say a little bit more about, um, what we have got there with mediation is a process which comes into play when there's a dispute, when there's conflict between two or more people. And the idea of mediation, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, looking at who's on today, but for those of you who would need a, a bit of a reminder, is a way 
to bring about a better and more constructive conversation between two or more people. So we're looking at improving the quality of a dialogue, the quality of a discussion by having an impartial third party there in order to usually preclude the need for any formal action such as grievances or disciplinaries or court or, tri or um, employment tribunal action, which is where the trades union representative would particularly come into play. So what we're trying to do in mediation is to preclude the need for all of the processes that would be the bread and butter of the trades union representa uh, representative. But mediation essentially is looking at the relationship. We're looking at jo not just a dispute about XYZ working condition, but we're looking at the underlying relationship, how people get on, how they relate, the quality of dialogue they have, how well they understand each other, um, and also how they negotiate. So mediation can address not just what we talk about, but how we talk um, and getting to the point where we can have better dialogue and manage conflict better. Conflict is inevitable in every workplace. It's inevitable in many walks of life. Um, the question is how we manage it. Um, and we can't completely preclude com conflict. What we can do is we can learn how to manage it better. And quite often mediation is a great process for making that happen. So there's a, a very potted overview um, of what mediation can do um, as a comparison and contrast with the, uh, the trades union work. So with mediation, of course, it has to be voluntary. Um, people can't be made to take part. You can leave at any time. It also has to be confidential, so we don't retain any records um, and disclosures back to the organisation are very minimal, only what the parties in mediation choose to um, feed back to the organisation. And the third thing about it is it's future focused. It's not about um, attributing blame. It's not about apportioning um, who's at fault, who's right and who's wrong. Uh, but we're looking at trying to engender a shared responsibility for uh, what's going on, particularly looking at the future rather than the past. Um, and those are the three things that we need to have as underpinning principles of mediation. So um, confidential is important. I think with a lot of formal processes, grievances, disciplinaries, etc., we're not retaining. Uh, we are retaining records. Sorry, we are keeping notes. Sometimes we actually voice record um, meetings. Um, in mediation, however, it's confidential. It's informal. It's running as a parallel process to the formal processes. So quite a contrast there. And it's also not about who was right and who was wrong. It's about what are we going to do now differently. OK, so benefits of mediation. Um, we can deal with perceptions of unfair treatment. Um, precludes formal procedures where they're not needed. They are sometimes needed for sure, but uh, we can preclude unnecessary formal procedures and usually head things off at the pass. Um, and maintain the employment or working relationship. So a dispute does not have to be um, something that spoils the working relationship. A dispute can be resolved and strengthen the working relationship. So to sort out a way, the, the, the cliched term for it is the win-win, where both sides feel as if they've walked away from a dispute with more than they started. So actually maintaining and strengthening the employment or working relationship, we could say, uh, is a real benefit of mediation. Um, very flexible outcomes can be reached and mediation can be used in all sorts of places. So just a breakdown in trust, a breakdown in communication, clearing up a misunderstanding, um, resolving clashes between individuals. So mending relationships is the classic area uh, of application for mediation. Um, second one would be just that personality clash thing. So not just a general clash, but a personality clash where two people simply find they can't get on, where they bristle just walking in the same room as each other. Um, so uh, the personality clash is the classic thing for mediation and allegations of bullying and harassment. So we say on a case by case basis because um, often there are perceptions of unfair treatment, perceptions of um, bullying or harassment, which turn out to be uh, reducible to a, a breakdown in communication or a misunderstanding or actually a bit of mind reading about somebody imagining somebody thinking something of them, thinking ill of them, when it turns out not to be the case. That's, that's why we say on a case-by-case -case basis. So mediation is often used where things like bullying or harassment are alleged. Sometimes they are in place, but Sometimes it boils down to some, uh, um, nothing more than a communication breakdown, misperception, or a bit of negative mind reading.
Okay, where else can mediation be used? Well, probably when managers might be too close to a dispute. So uh, a lot of managers are really good at sorting out things with their employees. That's why they're managers. Um, but sometimes where there's a dispute between two employees, two colleagues or a team of colleagues, um, the manager, he or she, can't necessarily be called upon to resolve that dispute when you're too close to it, and especially when you have um, dissimilar relationships with your reports. So if there's somebody who's been there for 20 years who you know very well, who you play squash with, <clears throat> and somebody who's only been in the organisation for three or four months, we'd like to think we're impartial, but you wouldn't get perceived that way. This is a good time to bring in an impartial third party, a mediator, who can actually offer that extra level of independence and sort of external, um, the perception of uh, external impartiality. And then where mediation can also be used is where negotiations between unions and management break down. I'll just say a quick word here about the agencies you might have heard of, like ACAS. Um, stands for Arbitration, Conciliation and Advisory Service. So mediation doesn't get mentioned there. So what ACAS tend to do and do very, very well um, is conciliation when negotiations are broken down. So what that is, it's rather more of a process where a range of options is put on the table and we, we sort through these potential options um, and maybe modify and select what option would be better for resolving a dispute. It's not quite the same as mediation, which is where the parties might create and come up with a novel um, a novel um, solution or resolution to a dispute. With conciliation, you say, well, actually, we can't do this because, and you can't do that because, often limited by law or by precedent or by the, um, the sense of having, making sure that everybody's treated the same. So in conciliation, there is a limit put on the range of settlement options that are on the table. In mediation, that's not the case. Uh, anything is possible. So things like ACAS work really, really well. Um, it tends to be conciliation and advice more than mediation. Okay, wanted to make that point strongly because quite often people will say to us, oh, mediation, that's what ACAS does, isn't it? Not quite. Okay. Um, where mediation can't be used is to try and undermine agreed procedures for people to go beyond what they are actually afforded in their employment contract um, or denied in their employment contract. Um, or where managers want to avoid their responsibilities. So mediators don't do management. And I think it's, it's something that we find um, quite often is we are defining that line between what a manager is expected to do and what he or she is expected not to do um, and what can be passed over to a mediator. So mediators can't do the management for you. There are responsibilities on management which do need to be met. Um, it's not something that we can, um, we can take off you. Um, or when a decision or judgment is needed. So mediators don't make decisions or judgments for people. So we can't say, yeah, it's, it's up and not down or it's left and not right. Um, or a decision around what's, a fair, what's fair pay or a decision around what kind of a, a, an annual leave entitlement you should have or a decision around how you should apportion who works from home post-COVID and who doesn't work from home post-COVID. Okay, so those decisions or judgments um, can't be made by mediators. So mediators don't determine disputes. We don't arbitrate um, and come up with answers. Neither do we um, make decisions or rulings around um, settlements to disputes. Sometimes people come into mediation and they don't actually have the power to settle the issue. So they might be saying, look, we don't want to work on this site because it'd be better if we worked on this other site. Um, well, they don't perhaps have the power. It's not within their gift to decide where they work. Um, and that's not something that can be changed or uh, agreed or agreed differently within mediation. So sometimes parties don't actually have the power or authority to settle a particular issue uh, and mediation can't give them that power. So that's a, another example of where mediation can't be used. And the last one really is about where somebody is absolutely intransigent, refusing to budge for whatever reason. Um, we would usually offer the, the, the option of mediation. People may come into it reluctantly. Um, and if they decide within mediation, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually uh, move at all. I'm not going to give any ground. Then you're probably not going to get anywhere. Um, we would hope that people don't volunteer for mediation and then do that. And within mediation, we have a notion of improper conduct. So if people actually come through the door and into mediation, but then refuse to negotiate or refuse to take part, we're into a different area where we may have to respond to that conduct as being clearly improper, obviously improper. Okay, so there's a few things about mediation. 
And then just moving on now to think about trade unions and mediators working together. Just before I do, we'll just add a question by email from David. Thank you, David. Um, if the skills are so similar, do you think it would be a good idea for union reps to train as mediators? Well, our experience is, yeah, it's a great idea. Um, we did do, um, or we have done and continue to do, um, a number of uh, training courses for trade union branches, um, which work very well, David. So, yeah, our evidence is um, that it's actually a highly successful thing. And I think what we've seen with union reps training as mediators is they are very pleased to have this very pragmatic and future-focused set of tools for resolving issues between their members and management in particular. So we did train a group of union reps quite recently who are kind of troubleshooters. They will go out to different workplaces, um, it's to smaller workplaces where they wouldn't necessarily have their own rep in-house. So people from the regional branch would actually go out and troubleshoot when there are uh, issues that have been raised by members. And these union reps were overjoyed that they now have this toolkit that they can take out and use to locally resolve issues that their members raise with them, often to do with management and often to do with personality um, issues. But to go into a workplace, to set up a mediation process um, on the back of the training they've had from us, be able to resolve something in a single day or half a day that would otherwise take an inordinate amount of time to do when you take it down that more adversarial route, the route of looking at people's entitlements and rights and wrongs, um, to use mediation as a pre-formal um, off-the-record process is a real gift to these trainees. Okay, so there we have it. Um, thank you for the question, David. If any, anybody else has got any questions, you're very welcome to chip in um, as I go along. So trade union and mediators working together. There's a nice example of where the trade union rep, uh, David, um, actually becomes a mediator. So indeed, they're working together. But let's suppose um, there's uh, we're looking at some overlap between the two things. So... A lot of people are very nervous about coming into mediation. They don't understand what it is. It might be the first time, possibly the last time they're ever going to use it. It's unfamiliar to them. They think it's some kind of an adjudicative process. They think they're going to be found wanting or they're going to have to apologize for their actions or be shown to be the person who's in the wrong. None of that's true. Um, and we do spend a lot of our time persuading people that's not true. However, people often need a bit of support bit of encouragement to come into a process that might otherwise be quite intimidating or scary for them. Trade unions can be really, really good at that. So um, we've done a lot of awareness raising with trade unions to say, if your member is invited into mediation, here's your role as a trade union rep, is to encourage them, to support them, to take part, to help them to understand <laughs> that the mediator will be impartial. They're not about apportioning blame. They're not about looking at the, the, the past so much as the future. They're not about um, uh, thumping on the table with regard to employment rights. It's about having a dialogue with the other side and coming up with a solution, clearing the air, clearing up misunderstandings. And for that union rep to be able to support that member into that process, big tick. Um, the figures are that mediation, when used appropriately, is successful in round about eight or nine cases out of ten. Okay, so call it four out of five. Um, and that's something that um, can be very encouraging to people if they go into it with the right mindset. Um, and I think going in there with a, um, you know, a shed load of worry on your shoulders about what's going to happen um, is quite normal. But it's a whole lot easier to walk towards this process when you've got a bit of encouragement from somebody you trust and somebody who knows you. Employees with any additional needs or special requirements can be accommodated with, and again, we've lent back on trades unions for this, where we've needed interpreters and so on, um, where people can, uh, it's, it's a resource where we can find um, um, support either for people with um, additional needs, with mental health challenges, um, uh, second language issues, or in some cases, British Sign Language interpreters. Quite often, the local trades union branch will be able to help out with something like that. Um, also, it's about making sure it's, it's about inclusion. It's about making sure that more people can take part, something they might otherwise not have used. And I think we think uh, generally that when people go to their local trades union rep and say, hey, I've got this issue with the employer or with a colleague, um, if that trades union rep can turn around and say, you know what, just give this a go. Give mediation a go first. I will take up your case. I'm very happy to support you. 
um, in this in, in an advisory capacity or in a, a sort of a conciliatory capacity but before you do that if you could think about using mediation first you might find um, it doesn't need to go any further so encouraging people to take part in a process they might not otherwise have entered into um, is a great role for the trades union rep so supposing we are having trade union reps encouraging people to make greater use of mediation, which would be a good thing um, from our point of view. Um, how's that going to look? So what's it going to be like if there is this union involvement in mediation? Well, one thing that we often hear um, with mediations that have been um, referred or encouraged with the involvement of local trade union is about this thing of representation and it's different in mediation i just want to clear that one up as well so we don't have representatives in mediation people attend on their own and speak for themselves once you get a representative there of course they tend to advocate for the members interests and in that case it becomes rather more about blame and fault about proof or disproof and it can tend to veer into the past around allegations um, and about supporting allegations. What we want in mediation is to have people discuss their perceptions and experiences of what's gone on with the other party. Yes, we will have to talk about the past and what people differently allege has happened in the past. We always get that. But what we're most interested in is people having an open and honest discussion uh, about how they've been left with what they allege to have happened and what they want to do now. Um, if you have an advocate, whether it's a trade union rep or somebody else in the room, then what they tend to do is advocate, which is about trying to instantiate that person's rights, making sure they are afforded all of their entitlements. And when we get into that, it tends to turn into more of a standoff than it needs to be. So the bottom line is people in mediation attend on their own and speak for themselves. OK, um, in which case we don't want reps in the room. It's not about advising or guiding. It's not about winning. A mediator won't advise you. Um, a mediator is not there to see who's right or wrong. A mediator is not there to try and get a winner and a loser. And a mediator certainly doesn't judge. So all of those things can be counter to formal processes. Um, and it's just that's why I dwell on that just a little bit, just to say they're different. They're very different. Um, if we do for any reason have one party in a mediation with a representative or advocate, then we want to make sure that the other person has it too. And there are instances, some of the ones I've mentioned there about um, second languages, about British Sign Language, about mental health challenges, where you do need a supporter around. Um, and if one party has the privilege of having a supporter there, we need to afford the same privilege to the other person. Quite often what happens in practice in mediation is that you just have the two disputing parties in the room, but their supporters will be available, but sometimes would sit outside. Uh, but, but be available during the breaks, be available for them to... Um, uh, to speak to in the uh, in the recess and so on so if there is a supporter or representative in the building present available we want to make sure that there is one in the building present available for the other side as well so that's just another consideration if you're going to have um, the union rep in that role Union reps have to abide by the rules just as much as everybody else does so if we do have anybody else in the room um, they need to sign up to our confidentiality agreement, for example. Um, there's quite strict rules with mediation around non-disclosure so that people can speak openly and honestly. We don't retain notes, we don't do any recording, uh, and anything that gets said in mediation can't be used in any later process. And they're very important for people to be able to speak on openly and honestly, to come clean, and also to um, explore the widest range of options possible. And people often make offers or... Um, would make suggestions or um, give apologies or whatever in mediation those things are off the table they're, they're done at a person-to-person -person level we're not recording it we're not noting it we can't use those things in any more formal process that might ensue after the mediation so the rules have to be um, kept by everybody including any advocate Okay, question we often get asked, um, and that sort of was David's question as well, is um, trade union reps as mediators, you bet. So it's really good to have mediators who do understand um, how union processes, HR processes work. Okay, good. Um, I've been doing it for 23 years. I don't have a great understanding of those things, but it can be a useful thing. But um, the second point here is about potential biases or conflicts of interest. We want to make sure... 
um, that whoever's in the role of mediator, they don't really, they shouldn't really have had any prior involvement with the parties and shouldn't have any ongoing relationship with the parties. So in order to engender this impartiality and independence, a mediator should have very little relationship with a party. If they've already been involved with them in a case and then they pitch up as the mediator, it's going to look wrong for the other party. It's going to look wrong for the other side. So it's very quickly noticed by the parties if there is this sense of partiality or one-sidedness in the mediator. And it's how the parties perceive that that matters. So a union rep who's had a, a long-standing involvement with an individual would not be the best mediator. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of skills in common, a lot of skills in common between uh, mediators and trade union reps in our experience. We've got a lot of time for trade union reps. Um, so uh, they would make those people good mediators. So there's a long list, but I've just pulled out a couple of things here. Um, good communication skills, um, approachability, an understanding of, it's not on that list actually, but an understanding of inclusivity um, and equal treatment. So a very non-discriminatory approach to conflict is something that we find is um, uh, strongly represented in the mindset of the trades union rep. So a sense of inclusivity, a sense of equal opportunity, um, a very non-discriminatory attitude. Brilliant. Uh, they're really good attributes and assets for a mediator to have. So as well as being a good communicator, perhaps somebody who can deal with high temperature conflict, who can deal with um, the kinds of ways that we behave when we are in strong disagreement with or when we're angry with somebody else. Those are attributes for a mediator, uh, which would um, quite likely be attributes of a trade union rep as well. This approachability in being able to um, uh, being able to meet people where they are is one way you could put it. Being able to get on with a wide range of people and being empathic, being sort of having this capacity to be able to put yourself into somebody else's shoes and to appreciate people's predicaments and how those predicaments might uh, leave them thinking and feeling. Um, so, and then this awareness of impartiality as well. Bias I've mentioned, but impartiality is an important thing when we are is the most important thing when we're working as mediators and i think if you've been around conflict a lot um you can tend to uh you can tend to have uh this in good measure this sense of uh, lack of bias or um a tendency towards being impartial okay so i think um as we move into just checking if we've got any other uh, questions here today as we move into the uh, towards the end of today's webinar so um just having a look now see if we've got any comments or questions another one from emma so emma says what happens if it's a dispute involving a non-member um because the rep is just there to support their member very good question emma and this does come up so in um, uh, a thorough training of a mediator that question will be thoroughly answered so um i think it's it's um, it would be a difficult thing for an employer if they have a dispute with an employee for that employee then to pitch up with their trade union rep and the trade union rep to say okay I'm impartial now um, so perhaps if they've had involvement with that member they're perhaps not the best person to do it uh, but what we've done and what we've seen happen with trade union branches is that uh, a different trade union rep would come in trained as a mediator would come in and can indeed engender that impartiality it might need a little bit of encouragement and persuasion of the employer to believe that that incoming um, mediator uh, is indeed going to be impartial but what we always say as mediators is if people are perceiving you as being partial or, or being biased i would always say look if i say or do something that suggests to you that i am being less than impartial stop me tell me what it is and we'll put it right um, you know, my endeavour is to be impartial. I'll do my best to do so. But if there's anything that you see me say or do um, that you think contravenes that, contradicts that, just let me know and we'll address it. And I think the same thing could be true. So what I'm talking about is not that person's close to home union rep, but perhaps a different union rep from regional branch, different part of the country um, to come in. If they're trained in mediation, they would understand impartiality to be able to come in and do that mediation between a member and an employer it works we've got good evidence that it works okay very good right so as we move into uh moving towards the end of today's um let's think if there's any other 
any other questions thank you you have used the uh, the chat box on the right hand side for a couple of comments and questions there um, we usually get a few more after the presentation so if anybody does have anything they want to raise with this meantime let me mention uh, about a few other events we've got around the corner so we do these webinars once a month usually on a Friday as a link just appeared in the chat box if you want to register for any of our webinars you'll also find on our website um, forward slash webinars you'll find a library of previous webinars so some um, notes from well recordings of upcoming uh, previous webinars and also a list of what's around the corner what's upcoming um, but have a look on there big big library of webinars we've been doing these for quite a while um, and we'll be building up a similar library on the EU mediation website as well. For those of you who've missed it, um, we've started a branch based in County Cork in Ireland. Uh, we now have uh, our foot in the EU, as it were, post-Brexit. Um, so we're getting around some of the, uh, the problems that were presented to us by Brexit by having a branch in the EU. So we're building up a library of webinars also on the EU mediation website. Around the corner in February, we've got a webinar on ensuring workplace well-being. There's a very close tie-up between well-being and conflict. Um, not just that um, uh, people who are not in a state of good well-being may find themselves coming into more conflict, but also conflict does compromise people's well-being and mental health. Um, so looking at the tie-up, um, particularly looking at preventing interpersonal conflict that could lead to stress and stress-related illness. Um, sickness and absenteeism and presenteeism by the way and next one around the corner after that is on friday 24th of march we often get after these webinars people saying okay so what do i do what do i do how do i train as a mediator so in a very non-salesy way i hope um free webinar in march looking at your very first step uh, when you decide to train in mediation who, who who trains as a mediator why you would do it um, all the way through to some tips about how you would set yourself up as a professional mediator either uh, freelance or working within your organization so hopefully everything you'd need to know all about that so all the uh, all the steps okay and that one's in march so for today what i would say is thank you very much for your questions and comments um do keep in touch with us this has been our webinar today on trades unions conflict resolution thanks ever so much for watching um have a good weekend and we'll see you next time